nothing. Nothing compares to the promise I have. Oh, nothing. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. It's good to see you here tonight. Thank you so much for coming to be with us on this Wednesday evening to worship the Lord. My, did we not have a great day this past Sunday. The Lord blessed and moved in a mighty way. I believe God's up to something. I believe he is getting his church ready. I believe we are winding down hurriedly. The Lord is soon coming. So thank God for the privilege we have to come to church, to make our calling and election sure, to get closer to him, to have fellowship with the saints, to encourage one another. What a blessing it is to be a part of the family of God. Looking forward to our study tonight. Sister Melissa Bishop will be teaching tonight. Looking forward to that. We'll remind you of this coming Friday morning at 10 o'clock, World Day of Prayer. The church sanctuary will be open for those that would like to come by for some time of prayer at 10 o'clock. Also Sunday beginning a brand new month, this month of March, and hopefully we'll see God move in a great way. We got a lot of exciting things that are coming up in the next few months so looking forward to all the Lord has in store should he tarry I believe he is coming and coming soon so everything is contingent on the coming of the Lord we want to go to the Lord in prayer remember those tonight that are sick pray for Beth she is sick tonight pray God would touch her also Rob and Monica continue to pray for them and their healing but Rob's been having some pains pray that God would remove that pain and heal him and deliver him also, Chase called and asked us to pray a special prayer tonight for Jessica. She is not herself today and pray that God would touch her and heal her and also touch them, uh, that they'll have peace of mind. 
always somebody to pray for, always someone in need. Uh, Brother David Craig's grandson was in the hospital. I think he was supposed to come home today, and uh, he is uh, uh, battling some issues. Pray God would touch him. Do you have unspoken requests but lift of hand? Let's believe the Lord for these tonight. Pray for this service. Pray for God's touch, his blessings upon us. Father, we thank you that we can call upon you and know that your eyes are on the righteous and your ears are open unto their cry. Thank you, Lord, tonight for blessing us with the privilege of prayer. We can pray and know, Lord, that you are able to do great and mighty things that we know not. We can bring our petitions, our requests before you and know tonight that you're able to move upon every one of these individuals to bring healing to their bodies, deliverance to them, strength to them. We ask you to move upon every request tonight, those that are lost, that they would call upon your name to be saved. We pray your blessings upon the word tonight. Draw us nearer to you. We pray that you would strengthen us. Help us to be like you want us to be. We praise you for all you've done, for what you're doing and about to do. For it's in the lovely name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen and amen. Would you take a moment now and welcome one another to the Matthews Church of God. We're delighted to have you with us tonight. Can we just take a moment and raise our hands right now and worship the Lord? Lord, we honor you and we praise you tonight. We exalt you in this place, Lord. We lift your name on high. Far above all gods you are, Lord. And we worship you tonight. Sing this with us. For thou, O oh Lord,
Now let's sing, You are worthy, because He is worthy. Continue to worship him as you're seated. Amen. I want us to worship and give it. As I was thinking earlier today about giving to the Lord. I like one of the things that Brother Baker said. And he made the statement, said, we can't pay God for the blessings that we receive, the protection he gives, the goodness he provides. And this is not a payment, but I've always heard that when we give to the Lord, we basically, we put our money where we're committed. And I'm committed to God, therefore I give to Him because not expecting anything back, but very simply because I love Him. And it's just like if one of my children were to come to me and say, Dad, I need so-and-so, but I don't have the money. I would do everything I could to do that for them. I know that in a time of need, that God has everything in the palm of his hand. Much has been said today about a speech that was made last night. As I thought about that, I thought, you know something, I'm not looking for comfort in the words of men, but I'm looking for comfort in the words of God and what he tells me, and I can always find it. I want us to give tonight because we love him. Because of what he's done for us. And he's made it possible we can give. Let's bless the name of the Lord in tithes and offering. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you and we praise you and we love you. God, I ask, Lord, that you will touch as we give to you this day and this hour. God, because you have blessed us beyond measure. God, the things that you do for us that... Sometimes we fail to even recognize. But God, we're thankful. God touches, we give to you in Jesus' name. And we bless you, we praise you, and we thank you. And amen, and amen. God bless you.
Isn't it good to be in God's house tonight? After a hard time of work, it's good to come to his house. Sister Livian, you were right. Tonight our lesson is the calling of discipleship. And before we get started, I'd like to pray. Father, we love you. We thank and praise you that we can come to your house one more time, that we can worship you, that we can open the bread of life. And Lord, I cannot do this without you. I've done the best that I can, and I pray that you would take your word and minister to your people tonight, and I praise you. In Christ's name, amen. Our scripture references, if you want to follow along with me, are from the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. And, you know, I think often we forget and we fail to realize that our salvation is not just a gift to keep us out of hell. Would you agree with me on that? But a calling to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Discipleship did not end with the disciples, the 12 disciples, but it should continue in each of our lives. So often we hear they have a call on their life or she's been called. But I want to tell you tonight that each and every person here has a calling on your life. And just like those first disciples, they were not called to support Jesus' ministry. They were called to be his ministry, and so are we. So let's go ahead and get into the word. We're going to start with Matthew 4, 18 to 20, and Jonathan's going to help me. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. I want you to go back with me a moment. Put yourself there. Think about these two men out fishing. They were hardworking men. They were supporting their families. They were husbands. They were fathers, like you all tonight. Ordinary men, uneducated men. And I believe that that day began as any other day. But that day would change their lives, wouldn't it? They were tired because they had been working. They were casting out their nets and pulling in the catch. They smell like fish in perspiration. Their clothes were dirty. If you were to look at those men, if I was to look at them, I don't believe that I would pick them as disciples of Jesus Christ, someone he would pick. But when Jesus said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, you know what I like about that? He related it to them, didn't he? They were fishermen. And you know what? Fishermen, my father, was he loved to fish. There's a, a, a great amount of patience and tenacity and perseverance and skill in fishing. Anybody like to fish here? Jesus knew that these men would use these qualities to win men and women to Christ, and that's why he called them. Something else that I think is unusual, they immediately got up, they left their nets, they left the catch, and they followed Jesus. Immediately. I want us to keep that in mind. We're going to go on to Matthew 4, 21 to 22, and we're going to read about the calling of two other brothers. Jonathan? And going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. 
and they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. These brothers were also fishermen. And I think it's interesting that they were on a ship and they were with their father. This leads us to believe that they, they had a family fishing business. It was probably quite, quite lucrative. But they left their father and they also immediately went to follow Jesus. Now, as I studied this, and I, I know we all have heard this all of our lives, I, I found it odd, and it just kind of hit me. What would cause people to immediately leave their everything? These guys didn't think. And as a child, when you hear this, you think, oh, they just walked with Jesus for a little while, and then they went back to their life. They didn't. When they left that day, they left everything behind. Everything. They left their, their business. They left their family. They left the comfort of their home. They left it all. They really did. Another thing that struck me odd, they didn't know Jesus, did they? They didn't know he was the Messiah. They didn't have a preacher. They didn't have a church. They didn't have the Bible. Why do you think they would follow him? Number one, I don't know about you, but I think God had been working in their heart long before this. What do you think? But I also believe that the presence, the very presence of Jesus Christ makes a difference. And when they saw him and when they felt that presence, they had to follow, and they did. What do you think it would be like to leave everything? You know, we have a hard time just making it to church and paying our tithes, and, right? We do, huh? A man named Tony Coppola said this, Being a Christian requires betting your life on the truth of the gospel and committing yourself with all the risks involved. It requires abandonment of the securities of the world. And it requires that you launch out into unknown waters where the threats are great. I think the day that they left the boat, they didn't realize what was ahead of them. Hunger, homelessness, pain, persecution, beatings, torture. Peter, Andrew, and James would be martyred. For the gospel, John would be boiled in oil and exiled on the island of Patmos where he would write the book of Revelation. And somehow I think that we have the view today that we're not really required to give anything. But I would say to you and me, that we are required to give the same thing that they did. Everything that we have. Everything. Have you stopped to consider that because of these men's sacrifices, we're here tonight? Today, I believe we see the gospel as a gospel of comfort and privilege and prosperity and happiness. We see churches attempting to draw people in with entertainment, programs, musical ability, and suffering is not popular. But if we are going to be disciples of Jesus Christ, we will suffer for him. But I want to tell you something. If we suffer with him, we're going to reign with him too. And that blesses me to think about it. So let's move on to Matthew 9, 9. And this is the calling of a different man. As Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. Matthew was a different man. 
He was not a fisherman. Matthew was a tax collector. And no one likes the tax collectors, right? But in this time, they were despised because not only were they crooked, but they were, they were seen as unclean by the Jews, and no one wanted to have anything to do with them. And Matthew knew who he was. He knew he was a sinner. And I believe he was deeply touched when Jesus would call a man like him. Luke chapter 5 gives a little bit more about the calling because Matthew, in the book of Matthew, was talking about his own calling. Luke says this, that Matthew left everything behind. He got up and he followed Jesus. He left his office. He left the money. He left everything. And the call of Matthew was very, very important because it showed everybody that Jesus didn't just call the good people. Jesus called the worst of the worst. When he saw Matthew, he saw potential. He saw what this man could be, and he loved him. And Matthew realized that. And he declares his love for the Lord in Matthew eleven nineteen, when he said that Matthew, what Matthew said, Jesus was a friend to sinners. And I praise God that he is a friend to sinners to, tonight. And I would say that we, each and every one of us, need to remember where we came from. I think in church sometimes we somehow feel justified. We feel better than the people in the world. We feel superior to them. I would never do that. That would never happen to me. No. Except for the grace of God Almighty, that could be each one of us. We can never be too holy and pious to reach down into the ditch and pull someone out because that is exactly the kind of man that Jesus Christ was. He got his hands dirty. He got down with the sinners and the prostitutes and the people that nobody would have anything to do with. And I praise God that he got down there for me and pulled me out. So we have these men, and along with them, Jesus would choose seven others. And now we're going to move on a little bit, and we're going to go to Matthew 9, 10 to 13. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am come, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Back in that day, a meal was not just something common. A meal was a very important thing, and those folks that you had a meal with, it was pretty important. It was, it was seen as a very close relationship. And when the Pharisees saw Jesus eating with these, quote, sinners, they began to talk about it. They couldn't understand why in the world he'd have anything to do with these people. They, sh they certainly didn't. They'd given up on them long ago. But Jesus said something very unusual. He said, you know what? I didn't come for the good people. I came for the sick people. And I love the fact that Jesus called himself a physician. And isn't he just that to us? He heals us in so many ways. It's also interesting that he said, you guys, you Pharisees, you experts in the law, you think you know everything. You know what? You need to go back and learn some more. You don't know it all. 
because I don't want your sacrifice. I don't want your rituals. I don't want what you do every week. I don't want the fancy clothes. I want your heart. And your heart is not after me. And don't we see that today? People know what to say. They know how to dress when they come to church. They know how to raise their hands. They know how to sing the songs. They know how to seem holy, right? But it's just like the Pharisees. And Jesus said this. He said, your, your whitewashed tombs, your tombs, it's been painted and fixed and pretty, but inside, dead, decaying bones are there. And, you know, I think we are going to be very surprised when we get to heaven because I think some of the people that we were just sure would be there, I don't think they're going to be there. And I think some of the people that we think, oh, no way, they're not making it, I think they're going to be there. Because you know what? We don't know what's in here. And that's what's most important. And these men, there was nothing good in there. So let's go ahead and move on to Mark 3, 7 through 12. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea. And a great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea and from Jerusalem and from Endumea and from beyond Jordan. And they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. And he spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. For he had healed many, insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him, as many had plagues. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, Thou art the Son of God. And he straightly charged them, that they should not make him known. So Jesus was tired, I believe, and he wanted to get away. He wanted to get away and rest. He wanted to get away with his disciples. But as hard as he tried, the people knew that he could heal them. And multitudes of people came. They were desperate people. They had no hope anywhere else. Nobody else could help them. And Jesus took the time, as tired as he was, he healed them, and he also cast out demons. And it's interesting that they themselves threw the person down and said, Thou art the Son of God. And Jesus told them to be quiet and not tell it. And I always kind of wondered about that. But it was not time for Jesus to be revealed as the Son of God. And they were really being disruptive. And that's why he commanded them to be quiet. But what's most important about this is that he had complete power over sickness and the devil. And let's move on. Mark three thirteen to 19. And he goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would. And they came unto him. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses, and to cast out devils. And Simon he surnamed Peter, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder, and Andrew and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into an house. What's most important in the last passage, Jesus demonstrated that he could heal, and he could cast out devils. Here, he gave them the power to heal, and them the power to cast out demons. 
And when we look at this, I think, we think, wow, that's great. Isn't that wonderful that he did that? I think we believe that we're somehow different, don't we? Are we not called as they were? Are we? Do we not have the same Holy Spirit that they had? I believe that part of the reason that the church as a whole is ineffective is because we do not realize the power that has been given to us and we do not use it. I think Satan has convinced us that we're weak, we're vulnerable, and we can't fight against him. And I think some of you old timers, I'm going to call myself an old timer because I grew up in the church, would probably maybe experience that maybe, Pastor, you've, this has happened to you. But I remember as a small girl in my church, the Christiansburg Church of God in Virginia, we, it was a Sunday evening service, and a young lady came in and sat on the back row. I'd never seen her before. She was new to our church. But as the pastor began to preach, she became very, very disruptive, talking out, laughing, really hindering the word going forth. And I remember my pastor calling her to come forward. And I remember she kept laughing. She wouldn't come forward. This went on for a little while. And he looked back at her again. And he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come forward. And she got up out of her seat and she came forward. And immediately she began to bargain with him to leave her alone. Don't bother me. Leave me alone. I'll buy you something. You just leave me alone. And I remember the feeling that I had that this was evil. And I remember him looking into her eyes, and my mother, I'm sure, remembers this too, and saying, in the name of Jesus Christ, Satan, I command you to come out of her. And he did. And I remember the expression on that girl's face changed, and the whole atmosphere of the church changed. And you could say, wow, he was a man of God. And truly he was. But you know what? We have the power in us to do the same. There's no reason why we cannot. And we need, as God's people, to remember who we are. We really do. So many years of my life, I felt powerless. I felt defeated. And maybe you feel that way yourself. When I was a young teen, I had a horrible event happen to me, an attack that would change my life forever. I would face shame and anxiety the rest of my life, and I face it now. I had panic attacks when I was young. I couldn't hardly, I couldn't, going into a, a store was difficult for me. It would come on so bad that I would have to hide in the store. I would have to go to an aisle by myself and try to calm myself down. As I got older, the anxiety centered on the church. Every time I went to church, it was so bad I could barely sit in my seat. I remember my mother praying for me. It was so terrible. As I got older, I gave up on going to church because I couldn't do it anymore. I was saved, I was living right, but I couldn't do it. I would beg God to help me. I would cry. My mother would pray. Uh, this went on for many years. I couldn't figure out why God wouldn't help me. 
I went on living like this for years, in defeat. One day I decided I'm going to go to church. I'm, I'm going to go. I'm, I'm going to go. And I was married then. So I got myself together and I went. And I just believed that God was just going to help me and take this away. And you know what? I'd like to tell you that he did. But that's not what happened. Once again, it happened to me. I couldn't stand there. I, could, I couldn't. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And God showed me over the next couple of weeks that I had the power to do something about this. That he wasn't going to just take it away from me. It's kind of like if somebody attacks you and you have a gun beside of you, but you don't pick it up and use it. I think we all do that sometimes. So I went to church the next Sunday, and I'd been taught all my life, if you resist the devil, he has to leave. And also, I thought, you know, this is just me. This is just my anxiety. This is what happened. This is just me. But we have to realize that these are attacks from the enemy. They're not just me or you. Number one, they're an attack from the enemy. Number two, we have power to defeat it. So when I went back to church that Sunday, I sat in a pew. And guess what? Here it came. It came on again. And I... I just closed my eyes and I said, Devil, in Jesus' name, I rebuke you and you got to go. And you know what? It left for a little while, but guess what? It came back. And I had to rebuke him over and over and over. But you know what? I got victory over it. And he still comes to me today with this stuff. But I guarantee you, if you rebuke him in Jesus' name, he has to go. And, I, you know, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know if you're facing problems like this or not in your life. Anxiety, fear, depression. Ever wake up in the morning and just feel dread? Anybody ever felt that way? You think, oh, wow, what is this? I can tell you what it is. It's the enemy. That's what it is. And we have power over it. We do. And as I close, I would like to remind you one of my favorite verses that helps me. It's found in Ephesians 4, 1. Jonathan, would you read that? As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. You know what? We've been called by an awful high, precious calling. We're awfully blessed. we got to walk worthy of it. First thing we have to do is keep ourselves pure. This is a bad world we're living in. We have to make a commitment that we're going to keep ourselves pure before God. we got to lift up Jesus Christ in everything we do. We can't run with the world, drink with the world, laugh at the world and their stuff. We've got to lift up Jesus Christ. We're his children. We're his ministry on earth. And lastly, we need to remember exactly who we are. The battle's already been won. We've got to remember that. When I was back there in the pew... And I, couldn't, I could not even stand. I couldn't even look at the pastor. I just wanted to run away. You know what? I was, I was more than a conqueror back then. I just didn't realize it. And when we fall, and we do, and I've had a rough time myself, you know what we got to do? When we fall, we got to get up. And we got to square our shoulders. And we got to keep going forward. And if it means crawling, we do it. And if it means eating dirt, we do it. 
It means never, ever giving up, no matter what. No matter what the devil brings, we're not giving up. We are not giving up. And that's just the bottom line, folks. We're on our way to heaven. We're on our way to heaven. And whatever happens, no matter if nobody goes with me, I'm going. I'm going. And I know you feel that way. And I would just say to you, walk worthy of the precious, holy calling that God has called you to tonight. I mean, musicians to come if they will. Sister Melissa, thank you so very much. Reminding us that we are disciples. We are to be fishers of men to win the lost. Would you stand? We want to ask you to come tonight around the altar and spend some time in prayer. There's so much to pray about. We mentioned request earlier. We continue to pray for the situation in Ukraine. We continue to pray for our nation. So many people are going through so many things. So would you come and let's pray tonight and ask God to intervene and pray for our church that God would continue to help us and to bless us. Hey, 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 hey. 